this talk was already in, in the schedule of uh, Easter egg and it was announced as being English but uh, there were only German speakers in the room so I figured I'd do it in German um, but even though there still seem to be only German speakers here I'm still going to do it in English so you're out of luck uh, just for I guess for the tape so that we have this in English okay anyway so I'm uh, Andreas or Fraxinas um, in the Aschaffenburg uh, hacker maker space uh, Schaffenburg e.V. and um, I built a photo booth and this talk is going to be about why and how and all of this. Uh, first off, what is such a thing? What is a photo booth? So um, you probably remember the actual photo booth cabin things in uh, train stations or at the city hall where you could get passport photos printed. Uh, they used to work with actual uh, developing film uh, and uh, of course now there are digital with digital cameras and digital printers and yeah they're still around just not as popular anymore and um, of course nowadays the term booth refers uh, to devices that you don't necessarily have to climb into and you're encased in a little box but it's also for just the device that stands somewhere or hangs on a wall and um, yeah in uh, Japan uh, there are really popular devices called Purikra and it comes from Print Club and there are little uh, things that came uh, up in the 1995 by one of the major uh, digital game manufacturers, I forgot which one, Konami or something, and um, you could basically take a picture of yourself and then you'd have a, a, a little uh, screen and you could put clip art on it and move it around and then print little stickers and it, they're still very popular in Japan. So uh, a photo booth as I refer to or as it's generally referred to is a device that will take a picture of you after a countdown usually and then you can preview yourself in the screen digitally decide whether you want to print it or not and um, uh, they don't even necessarily have to have a printer sometimes they just capture the photos like on a uh, wedding or something and then they may go into a digital photo album um, or, of course, nowadays uh, you may want uh, to upload them to Facebook or to any social network thing, the popular things. Not so popular on events like this, but still. <laughs> uh, and of course, usually photos are saved on hard disk or SD card or not. Um, yeah, and sometimes you have funny props that you can use and disguise yourself or make yourself even prettier than you already are. Yeah, typical use cases, I already mentioned weddings and of course birthday parties, big corporate events or uh, congresses like this, affairs. Yeah. So our motivation, why, why uh, did we build such a device was um, it's really fun to use. So I was at a birthday party at a 40th and we printed over 500 copies on that night with roughly 100 guests and it was really funny. Uh, everybody had a great time. And um, I wanted uh, to, to have that uh, photo booth for, for an event, for a charity event, Christopher Street Day in Aschaffenburg. And uh, then I found out how much these things actually cost when you rent them. They're really expensive. Uh, goes up to like 1500 euro a day. Uh, and I thought to myself, well, for that price, we can probably build one ourselves out of used, uh, used parts. Uh, and so I decided, yeah, why don't we just do that? Um, considering that on that date, that photo booth wasn't available anymore anyway. Um, yeah, and uh, it turns out we can actually use it to uh, make some money out of it because uh, people pay uh, donations to get their 
uh, photos printed. And when we're on a public event, on a fair or something, um, yeah, people have a lot of fun taking pictures and then printing, printing them, having something as a souvenir to take home. And we hand out our little flyer from our hackerspace and they give us a donation for the prints. And it's a win-win situation. And of course, when you start from scratch, then you really have to plan it and you learn a lot. It's the software, it's the hardware, it's the woodworking. <laughs> uh, bring it, bringing it all together, uh, like interdisciplinarily, uh, that was an, uh, a big, nice project. And it's ideal if you want to delegate it into uh, different groups, like one group does the software, one group does the Arduino or not. Um, so our approach building that thing was first I wrote an experimental capture program. Um, so is it possible using a digital uh, a DSLR camera, not so much a webcam, that would be too easy, a digital actual good camera, um, capture a preview image, a live video, and then capture the photos through USB with a little program. Um, so when that worked, I decided, yeah, uh, let's go for a printer. And we bought all the different parts, plugged it together, and then um, once that worked, um, built the, the cabinet, the case. Yeah, and then at the end, added some effects and the flash and everything. So about the software architecture. Uh, so of course, it had to be all free software. We didn't want to use proprietary camera uh, makers, drivers. We didn't want to use Windows or anything closed source. So of course, the base is Linux. And then um, there's three main parts that I use three frameworks or libraries to build the photo booth application. And first part is libg photo 2 and this is a, uh, an abstraction for uh, basically every uh, digital camera that there is. Like, uh, there's like 2,000 or something supported, uh, more or less. Uh, you have a pretty high level API and you just tell it, uh, take a camera or take a picture, uh, download the picture, take preview video, and it does it all for you. You don't have to deal with separate uh, camera drivers or manufacturing uh, or manufacturer's specialties for the different USB, whatnot. So that makes it really easy, but it's also a little tacky. It, it doesn't work perfectly yet. Uh, you'll see later. Um, the documentation is not very uh, nice either. So it's pretty much non-existent. There are a few examples that you can use, but it's, nah, it's not so easy, but it's getting better. They're still working on it. So for example, this is a, a little uh, sample command and what it'll, what it'll do, it'll just, uh, it'll just do what it pretty much says. It'll take a picture and download it as a file, then I have it, and then I can display that, and voila, this is a live picture from just now. Uh, pretty easy, it's just one command, and it works with any camera, pretty much. So that was nice to have. Um, going back to this, uh, the next big column I call it is GStreamer, and GStreamer uh, does everything that has to do with video processing and image processing in the photo booth software. So GStreamer is a uh, general purpose multimedia fr framework. It's uh, pipeline based. Uh, I'll go into that later. What that means, it's media agnostic, which means uh, you can pretty much convert everything into everything, read everything. It can be a text file or any network stream. So it supports everything. And if it doesn't support it, then you just write a plugin for it. Uh, yeah, there's countless plugins uh, in three different categories, like good, bad, ugly. <laughs> and it's super cool to use. 
um, you should take a look at it. Um, yeah, and for example, it allows you to, if you uh, capture a preview with the uh, G photo, that will output an a motion JPEG stream. So pretty much take one JPEG image after another and then send that to standard out. Then I can pipe that into GStreamer with GST launch, read it out with FD source, that pretty much reads the standard out again, standard in. Uh, decode bin is a magic element that'll find out what stream it is and then plug the necessary uh, elements to decode that. And auto video sync is uh, the element that'll show it on the screen. And I'll just do that real quick. Um, it's this command. I have this display equals zero um, because I'm working remotely so that uh, the, the terminal knows that I want it on that screen. And yeah, and this is the, the live view. Can I? Oh, no, not with that mouse. <laughs> so you can see this is uh, pretty much that screen. Okay. So the third part is uh, glib and GTK plus. That's the uh, GUI framework that I used. It's it's an old one that was originally created in, in '96 for GIMP. So it's uh, I think it even stands for uh, GIMP uh, something. So it's a, it's a it's a an acronym and. Um, yeah, it gives you everything that you you may know from like Qt or all the the widget uh, systems toolkits. You have buttons, sliders, and you have uh, below that you have an event driven system that'll let you uh, take all that and turn it into a program. So below the GTK, there's glib. That's also what GStreamer is based on, not libgphoto, even if. Even if it's called uh, gphoto, it doesn't use glib. Ah. Um, and it's a, it's a low-level core library that will pretty much bring um, an object-oriented uh, object uh, program in, into uh, ANSI C. So you can uh, use object-oriented programming and you have uh, threads and uh, signals and everything that you expect from a modern system. And since GStreamer uses that already, I decided to just go uh, and uh, use that in the photo booth too, and not Qt or anything else. That was a question last time. Um, yeah, there's a there's a, a builder software for for the GUI. And it's called Glade, and it's it's just a a UX designer that I used. Okay, so about the user interface of the software. Um, it's pretty easy uh, because it's meant to be used uh, like by by children or anyone just with a touch screen. Uh, it starts when you first start it up. It loads the parses the ini file, loads a couple of options from it. Uh, you can customize it extensively. Like uh, you have a template for uh, for the user user interface. You can replace and colorize all the, the widgets, the buttons, change the font, the size. And um, of course, an overlay image. This one still has the Easter egg overlay. I made one for GPN now, of course. And um, yeah, the, the save paths and the template, how the files that are saved should be named, the countdown duration, uh, the strings for uh, that should be displayed, like the say cheese, you could put any, anything else in there. Uh, translated, for example. And uh, settings for the sound, like the, there's a, a beep during the countdown, you could change that into anything. And you can also have a, a background video that'll play after a certain time. Um, I call it screen saver, it's more like a camera saver because the camera gets really warm during the live uh, view and takes a lot of energy goes through uh, the batteries real fast. And uh, settings, how many copies you want to allow, max and minimum, and uh, the uh, tokens for a social media upload, like Facebook, Imgur, uh, Twitter. Yeah, 
uh, so you, you, you start that up and then you set it somewhere and it'll go into the preview and people can see themselves on the screen when the, when a camera is detected and it starts and by touching the screen, the countdown will start, uh, it counts down from six to zero and then takes a picture and then you see uh, the picture on the screen. You can decide, do you want to print it? Do you want to cancel? And on, with the slider, you can select how many prints you want, how many copies. Um, and then once it's done printing, uh, you get another uh, button where you can upload it to uh, Imgur or Facebook if you want. It defaults to no upload, so if you don't do anything, then it'll disappear and go back into preview after a moment. Um, yeah. There's also a little status bar, uh, status bar in the bottom that'll tell you the uh, date, so you can see if it's still working, if uh, still counts the seconds. And then on the on the right side, there's a uh, a status of the printer, how many um, how many uh, copies you can still make. Uh, it's it's a big printer with a with a roll of paper that holds 600 copies, and it'll count down. So this is about the um, architecture of the application itself. Um, it has this is the main application context on the left side, and there's a capture thread that is. Um, yeah, that's pretty much controlling the libg photo commands, um, which will read from the camera, continuously read the um, motion JPEG stream that I've mentioned, and then hand that over to GStreamer, uh, which will display it, decode it and display it. And there's also the LED thread, uh, which is our LED class, which will uh, talk to the Arduino and make it all pretty colorful. Just maybe go into this real quick. So uh, once the capture thread is started, pretty much it'll do an init and then it'll just keep capturing video. And uh, this invokes the uh, uh, capture preview command of uh, libg photo. And then that's read by FD source and uh, displayed by GStreamer. Pretty much as I just showed you on the command line, this is all it does. Uh, when you take a picture, so when you start the countdown, that's a little more complicated because first off you have to close and re-init the camera, otherwise you don't get, uh, get to take a picture. It's a little tricky. Um, yeah, then uh, the, the countdown will start after, uh, after a moment or a moment later. The uh, LEDs will start flashing or will start counting a countdown, a colorful one. And then um, it will take the actual photo. It will read the photo into GStreamer and then it'll start a processing pipeline um, where it yeah, I've uh, let this out really uh, in, <laughs> in detail if you're interested. So it goes through a couple of times. The first time it uh, does a, a color correction so that the uh, skin tones look correctly and it'll capture that again and it'll print it. And at first it'll display it and then it'll print it or it, it'll capture it so that it can be printed and so on. So th these things are in our Git or online if you want to take a look at it. Um, so earlier I mentioned that GStreamer is uh, pipeline based. That means that you can uh, you have a data flow from the source to a sink and uh, with processing elements in between. And you can plug and play those together as you please. Uh, I, I go into the uh, video preview pipeline again. So this is that uh, FD source that reads from the camera, the, uh, the video stream, it'll filter it, the filter tells it which format it has. Then this is a J JPEG decoder element, which will turn the uh, separate JPEG images from the camera into a decoded video stream that you can work with. Like you, you can't, um, scale a JPEG video with GStreamer or a JPEG image, you can only scale raw stream 
or raw video with it. So first you have to decode it and then you can scale it so, so that it fits um, the screen size and the printer size because the preview video has pretty low resolution. That's one of the disadvantages of the um, G photo. Like I said, it, it, it's a really high abstraction, it works generally every camera, but it doesn't work very well with every camera. So you have a low resolution, a high latency, a low frame rate. Um, okay, so you have to blow it up to fit the screen, and then you have to maybe convert the um, uh, color space, and then you can uh, do an overlay of that um, mask, like of that Easter egg or GPN, whatever you want. That can have alpha transparency as well, so you need um, a uh, format that supports that. And then at the end, you can display that in the GTK sync is what the uh, what I chose. This is the video uh, pipeline and the, um, the photo pipeline is a little different um, than what I showed you earlier. So it doesn't actually save it as a file. Instead, it'll uh, save it into memory directly and then read that and uh, then do the JPEG decoding. Uh, it'll have to turn it, uh, it'll have to freeze it. That image freeze turns that single JPEG frame into a video stream. And then the video stream can be processed as before uh, with the overlay, a conversion, a gamma uh, is, uh, is like makes it darker or brighter can correct that. And that T element splits it up into three different paths. Um, and the first path is a LCMS, that's a little color management system. Uh, like I said before, that uh, corrects the skin tones because the type of printer that we use uh, need a color correction, a color profile, otherwise it looks really funny. Um, then the, the second uh, route goes into a JPEG encoder and that uh, turns that uh, raw video back into a JPEG image and saves it on a hard disk. And the third, third one just goes to the screen and displays it. And um, you may wonder where is the social media upload? The social media upload uploads the JPEG that's saved to the disk. So that's not an own path there. Okay, so I talked a long time about the software. Now let's go into the hardware real quick. Uh, we'll open up that box. And there is pretty much a uh, general purpose PC mainboard in it. It's a regular PC that runs Linux. And we work with a, uh, with a good a digital camera, um, like I said, it's uh, supported by LibG Photo. It has to be supported, but if it's a modern one, then there's a good chance. Like if you go with a Nikon or a Canon, or it's pretty much guaranteed that it'll work. Um, why are we using that and not just a webcam? It's because, of course, you get a lot better picture quality. If you want to uh, give the um, the JPEGs that you you save to a client, then uh, they have to be like decent quality. You could make prints from a webcam, that'll be enough. Uh, that's how the, the actual photo booth that you may find at a lot of places work, because it's a lot easier grabbing the video from a webcam and then just turning that into a photo than it is the other way around, but we do it anyway. Um, what also helps is it has a uh, flash uh, output, of course, on the top, the hot shoe from the camera that you can plug that in. And we are working with a cheap uh, wireless transmitter. So the flash is not controlled by the software or anything or LibG photo, it's controlled by the camera itself. Um, yeah, and the camera, of course, already existed. Uh, we had one and we have another one that we want to test it with. Um, yeah. So 
generally you will find a digital camera in any hackerspace maker play, uh, space i guess so you don't have to buy that specifically specifically for it and you can just put it in in the booth if you want to use it and then take it back out really easily it just mounts on the on the tripod mount good the next uh, component is the touch screen of course uh, i just bought something off ebay and it was uh, advertised as an open frame TFT touch display and it turned out to just be a, a really cheesy regular display and a resistive uh, glass with a sensor um, and a USB controller and apparently somebody hadn't gotten it to work and sold it again but it worked quite well in Linux this is an X input calibrator and it works like a like a mouse pretty much just uh, have to set the uh, coordinates and then it works. Uh, I use VGA because the HMI had some flickering issues. I don't know if it's a graphic card or the um, the controller of the uh, uh, display, probably more like that, but that's okay. Um, printer, I think, yeah, it's uh, over there. It's a really big box. Uh, why did we go with one of those? It's because we needed something that was really quick and had decent quality. And there's the little portable uh, um, photo printers, but they are super slow. They take over a minute for, uh, for a little photo and they are super expensive, like the media is. It costs like one or two euro for a single print. So uh, we decided we needed something that will be able to handle the case where there's six people standing in front and they want two copies for each one. Uh, we can't just make the people uh, wait for half an hour and then come back later. <laughs> they want it instantly. So we needed a, um, a thermal sublimation printer. This is like the type that you will find at the drugstore where you can go with your USB stick and print out your camera pictures. Um, I got one, uh, a used one from a photographer for a good price. Um, yeah, it, it has a, a big roll of paper, uh, like endless paper in it, and it'll actually cut with a knife, cut off the, the separate uh, pictures when they're done printing, and that makes it really cheap. So it's less than cents, uh, 15 cents per copy. And of course, the uh, thermal sublimation uh, means it's uh, dry right away. So you don't have to wait until some ink is dry or anything. You can touch it and it's fine. But those things are expensive. So this one would cost over 1800 euro when it's new. Uh, it's an older model, but the ones that come out still are in that price range because they're not consumer products. They are uh, professional equipment. Um, a problem, of course, is the availability of drivers. Uh, the manufacturers never make them. So I, I don't know of any thermal sublimation printer that has native Linux support. Uh, but there is uh, the Gutenprint project, and that has uh, drivers for a lot of uh, color laser printers or laser printers in general and also those dye sublimation printers, uh, thermal sublimation. Um, yeah. They ha uh, have another uh, problem. They're really big and really noisy and really heavy. Uh, when you, c you can actually really hear them work through the box uh, very loud. Uh, that's okay. Uh, so you need to carry, the, uh, carry that thing separately. It's 18 kilos roughly. And of course, you need to take care of the uh, image color match matching yourself because otherwise it'll come out looking funnily. It's like I mentioned before. Good. Yeah, the PC is a standard mainboard, uh, something that I had in, in the cellar just laying around, nothing special, nothing fancy. It would work with an embedded PC that would be nicer. We wouldn't have to worry about like open parts and uh, coolers that you could touch or but we just didn't have one laying around. Um, yeah, and there's an Arduino Uno, uh, which controls some RGB LEDs that we have to catch attention around the camera lens uh, and uh, a stripe on the printer tray, on the output tray. Uh, I'll just show you real quick. 
Um, yeah, I, could, I can just open the terminal emulation here and then probably make this a little larger and then just uh, it'll read uh, chars through the serial port and then turn that into commands. So if I uh, write a little C, then the countdown will start. This six seconds countdown. And this is supposed to focus the attention of the person that's being uh, photographed into the lens. It doesn't always work. Usually they look at themselves in the screen down below. Usually we have to tell them, please look in the lens. And then uh, a little F will make it flash. And uh, P and a number will make the the bottom one glow and shine in the processing colors of the uh, dye sublimation printer. So, you know, now it's doing the blue, now it's doing the magenta, now it's doing the yellow, and then this is uh, the, the real time. And then the print is done, just so that you know it's working. Of course, you can hear it unless it's really noisy. <laughs> okay, so let me exit that. Um, yeah, Arduino. Good. Okay, this is about the the woodwork. Um, we wanted uh, like a, a natural, friendly, environmentally friendly thing. We built it out of all used parts, so we didn't want a like an aluminum or a really shiny, high glossy box for it. Instead, we used wood, of course, and it's. Um, uh, it's 10 millimeter plywood covers, and uh, on the inside there's a, a framework from, uh, uh, yeah, with uh, like Leisten, that's the German word, I don't know what the English word is, uh, uh, frames probably. Um, yeah, I drew that in SketchUp, that's uh, the only software used in the whole project that's not open source, it's free but it's not open, uh, just because I knew how to use it. Uh, we could probably use FreeCAD or something it's just to draw, to draw that thing. This, these, these images also come out of SketchUp, and um, yeah, uh, I did it in the workshop of my dad, and he is pretty well equipped with uh, saws and different stuff. So uh, this is where we could do to do all of that. Um, one interesting detail is probably that I had to use uh, glazing tape for fitting that uh, screen into the into the the cabinet because it wasn't a uh, an OEM uh, open frame uh, screen after all it was just a regular one that is meant to be in a plastic case like the regular uh, uh, consumer one, so I, I used a, a tape that is uh, flexible, that's usually meant for building windows, on glazing tape. And that is used in different parts too, just for uh, like underneath the camera, on the camera mount. The camera is held on, uh, on the bottom with the uh, tripod mount and I made a custom screw for that because uh, it is a, uh, a quarter inch UNC mount as something that's not really used anywhere else in Germany. Um, yeah, so I used a regular screw and cut that mount into it. Uh, yeah, the printer and the camera are transported separately and all of the other components are fixed inside uh, the box. There's also uh, speakers, speakers that'll play a, a, a countdown beep and uh, can play some music. And we usually just put them on top, but um, they're supposed to go somewhere in the box, like on the side or something, once I figured out how to do that nicely. And there's the butterfly locks. This thing's here. And they allow uh, transporting it easily. It's like from stage equipment, like in a flight case, you can find those things. Uh, it's really sturdy and carry handles yeah and uh, the bottom is is a, a tripod and that is supposed to be a, a reminiscence of like actual photo tripods or optical devices 
like they still have the camera ones. And of course, they can't uh, they can't wobble if it's three instead uh, instead of four. That's another good thing. Um, yeah, of course, we also have some some three D printed parts. That is mainly the uh, the little tray that the photos fall into, and we've printed that on our uh, makerspace rep rep. And there's another part which is this thing that will protect the 3D LEDs. That's a little diffuser thing. And um, when the printer is not in the box, then you can also store that. And that way it doesn't break off, doesn't break off as easily. Hmm. Okay, yeah, issues. <laughs> um, well, so once we use that thing on a, um, on a uh, intercultural uh, fair in Aschaffenburg, and it was a really hot July day, glaring sun, and uh, the display isn't really fit for that. So there's not enough contrast to really be able to see yourself. So you have to turn it into the shade, uh, then, then it's possible, but it's not optimal. Um, that uh, fairground wasn't paved, so there was a lot of dust and the dust went everywhere. <laughs> so we were really uh, having a hard time getting it cleaned afterwards. Especially since we had to open the back. There is a cover for the back, but we couldn't close that because it was getting too hot. Uh, we are missing a few um, uh, fans in there. So the heat builds up, especially from uh, the printer. Uh, it's a thermal uh, sublim uh, sublimation process, which pretty much means it, it'll uh, uh, thermically, it'll heat um, a ribbon with uh, color swatches and turn that into, uh, um, in, into a gas phase and then bring it onto the paper that way. So it gets really hot. It has over 400 watts during the printing process. And the camera gets really hot. Uh, during the preview, considerably actually. And of course the display and the PC don't help either. Uh, so we, we need, uh, if we really want to use this during the summer outside, then we need some ventilation concept. And uh, it would be best to use uh, like filters in front of the uh, fans so that we don't suck all of the dust into it. Um, yeah, it, it usually takes a while, or it, we're getting better at it, we're learning, but it takes a while to set it up properly, just the photo setup. Uh, the exposure time, the, uh, uh, what's it called, the aperture, all of those things. Um, autofocus is uh, horrible, that went really wrong, so uh, the autofocus will, you can only um, trigger a photo and then it'll start focusing and the photo uh, the focusing may take from like 0.1 of a second up to two or three seconds because when there's people moving in the background or when it doesn't know how uh, what to focus on properly then it may zoom in and out all the way until it finds the uh, the, the sweet spot uh, and that wasn't really working well because we are doing a countdown and people expect the picture to be taken at zero and not some time. So we had to turn off the autofocus. And uh, just, we're usually just moving people into the, into the focus spot with a manual focus. Uh, there's a lot of room for improvements. Am I over the time? Okay, so I'll, I already mentioned some of these things. A uh, cool gimmick would be, for example, a coin validator. People uh, throw in a coin and then it takes a picture. Something like that. And just make it more robust or print QR codes on the copies so that people can download it or things like that. So the cost uh, was roughly about 1,000 euro. And that has already paid itself off by donations that people give us for the prints. Uh, so this is now a money-making machine for our uh, hackerspace. 
So consider building one if you want to have uh, some public relations and publicity. You can give out your flyers together with the prints and print your logo on the copies and make some uh, donations with it. Yeah, that's the intention. <laughs> okay, any questions? If we're, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. You got a microphone. How much time did it take making everything, including what everyone else did? Yeah, it took only about eight weeks, and that was because we had a strict deadline um, of that uh, one event, the Christopher Street Day 2016 in Aschaffenburg, that it had to be done for. And uh, we added a few things afterwards, like the social media upload. Uh, Twitter, we actually implemented during last Easter hack. Uh, so it still worked on and improved. But the, the whole thing, uh, like writing the first line of code and building the whole box only took eight weeks. Also, uh, wie viele Mannstunden? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> That it was a, 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 like a part-time project, and mainly me. There were a few people helping with uh, the Arduino and things, but it wasn't that many man hours. <laughs> Code is on Git, if you want to look at it. Uh, if you have any more questions, we're in the lounge, and you can come take a picture of yourself. Would be nice. <laughs>